Good evening. Here we are conversing with Professor Rajiv Karandikar. He's the director of the Chennai Mathematical Institute. He has been studying cephalogy for the past 14 years and actually doing the real stuff with the Indian uh, scene on elections. So good evening, Professor. We would like to talk to you about the elections and uh, cephalogy in general. How did you get interested in this? So, as a statistician, I used to be uh, interested in the results published in the media about opinion polls in India. Right. And whatever was written about methodology, which is very little, I used to be very critical of. And some of my friends used to say that, well, then why don't you do it? Right. And uh, I used to say, well, if someone asks me, I will get involved. But who will ask me? Because I was tagged as a theoretician. Well, uh, somehow in 1997, through some connections, through a friend, I was asked if I will be willing to help a group which is into in opinion poll and exit polls in India. And uh, I said I would be delighted to. And at the outset, I told them that I am a theoretician. I have never done any applied work. Uh, never analyzed any data other than in my MSc years uh -huh. and yet uh, I said I would be very interested in doing so and uh, at that point of time uh, in 97, uh, late 1997 when we talked the uh, elections in India were not due for at least three and a half years uh -huh. parliamentary election and we at that time were talking about parliamentary election mm -hmm. so I thought, I thought that this will be good time to get involved and over three and a half years we would develop robust methodology etc etc and we'll be ready for the real thing when the elections come up uh -huh. in 2001 when they were due and I had one meeting with uh, Yogendra Yadav who got me involved and uh, his team yep. and uh, five days after that uh, there was a crisis in India the uh, uh, Prime Minister resigned and uh, the house was dissolved and elections called in uh, roughly two months. I so see. my three and a half years of uh, comfort time was uh, cut down to two months or maybe two and a half months. I see. And uh, we had to start off, uh, uh, take it as a challenge and start off. I see. So let's talk a little bit about the methodology. Uh, more hard stuff, yeah, uh, so estimating the proportion of voters. Tell us something about that. Yeah, so the first step is uh, in opinion polls is to get the opinion of people, namely figure out what percentage of support is there for uh, the national parties uh, nationally uh -huh. and at the segregated at various levels, which would be useful later. But uh, take a uh, whole country or take a state in that we would like to know the percentage of votes that a, a party is going to get in the election. Right. So that is the problem of estimating of proportions of votes. I see. And uh, though directly that is of not of interest to people, the, that is the first step. Uh -huh. Now to do that uh, uh -huh. is where the standard statistical methodology of survey sampling comes in. Mm -hmm. so you, you generate a sample, you get their opinion, mm -hmm. you, you catch the people, get their opinion and uh, we kind of pretend that the sample proportion is the true proportion. In other words, we estimate the true proportions by sample proportion. Right. Of course, so the whole problem then gets down to generating a reasonable sample with right. which you are comfortable. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that is the most difficult step and uh, it can be done in many different ways. Uh -huh. Costs associated with each vary a lot. Uh -huh. And uh, unless you have a backing of someone willing to fund a more difficult exercise, which is costly, uh -huh. Uh, one can be awfully wrong. I see. So the standard methodology used uh, by market research uh, organizations for various market surveys uh -huh. is uh, what can be called as quota sampling. Uh -huh. uh, generally not found in statistics textbooks, but uh, the what it refers to is the given a sample profile that we want uh, a sample of size thousand, where. 55% uh, are men, I'm just giving examples, 55% so mm -hmm. are men, 45% women, 20% uh, rich, 30% middle class uh, and rest 50% from the lower class. Uh -huh. uh, in India, like then there would be a breakup on the lines of castes, there would be a breakup on the lines of religion uh -huh. 
uh, and whether they live in urban areas or rural areas. So let's say we get a, 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 a on these seven attributes. On each of the seven attributes, uh, you are given a target that we want so much percentage in each attribute. Uh -huh. And then it is left to the enumerators to actually generate a sample of that with the belief that if you have matched these seven attributes, then you would match their opinions as well. Mm -hmm. A premise which has no statistical backing. I see. And, uh, uh, but uh, if, if uh, a market research agency has to turn in a report within a day and, uh, you know, they want a very rough estimate, this seems fine maybe and that's what is done. I see. But in an exercise like uh, uh, opinion poll in a uh, democracy, uh, I think that is woefully inadequate. Uh -huh. uh, of course, uh, in uh, in the Western countries, uh, they have developed methodology which is based on uh, telephone surveys. And yes. You generate uh, randomized telephone numbers and then uh, you make telephone calls to get op op public opinion. Uh -huh. uh, so there the difficulty is then reduced to finding, uh, generating a sample of telephone numbers. Right. There is a work on that and so on. But uh, in India, the telephone uh, density is uh, still fairly lopsided, though the density has now gone up significantly from right. 1996. Right. Even now it is fairly lopsided and uh, I'm convinced that a telephone-based poll is not going to do it. I see. So we have to generate a randomized sample and actually do, go door to door, which costs a lot. But it pays dividend, at least in my experience. Uh, uh, we may not have been on the dot all the time, but as far as estimating a percentage of votes for parties is concerned, we have been fairly good all along. I see. Now, there is a critical question that comes after that. Once you get all these estimation of proportion of voters and so on, how do you translate that into seats? Yeah, so that is where uh, understanding of local political equations and local political scenario comes in. Uh -huh. uh, so this is going a little beyond statistics uh, and beyond sample survey now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for example, I'm now going to talk about Indian context because that's where I have done the work in. Right. That the, uh, the effects, uh, the, the, there's no nationwide mood of the nation. I see. It is broken up into 20 states, 20 odd states, big ones and some small states. And each state has a different political history. And uh, so the contemporary events affect each state differently. And each is sufficiently different from each other. Well, yeah, there are similarities, but each one has to be is sufficiently different that you need to treat it as a separate entity. I see. So we get down to a state level and estimate the uh, level of support for the leading parties in each state. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, of course, to actually translate into seats, that is not good enough. We need level of support in each individual constituency because right. it is the leading, whoever gets the largest number of votes is the winner. Right. Uh, first pass the first post pass system. the post system. So here we make a very simplistic assumption, as a, we make a call a first order approximation, that the way the support is distributed in a, across a state has not changed from the last election to the present one. I see. Because the demographics generally speaking, may not have undergone a major change. Uh -huh. So the change is kind of a level of support. So uh, 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 Congress party may have gained 3% uniformly. If they have gained 3%, then they gain 3% uniformly in each state, each constituency. Right. And if they have lost 5%, they have lost 5% uniformly in each constituency. I see. So our basis is the uh, last uh, actual poll data from the last election mm -hmm. in that particular state or the country, wherever, whole country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our assumption is that the votes are distributed as they were distributed the last time, though the level of support may have changed and that is what we estimate this time. I see. So, so we estimate level of support for a party in each state and then they distribute them the way they were distributed the previous time. That is how they get an estimate of votes for each party in each constituency. That's very interesting. And then we make a probabilistic transformation. So if, if, if two parties are very close, then level of support is say two or three percent difference. It would not be correct to interpret that whoever we are saying gets higher vote is going to win. Uh -huh. But if in somewhere else where our prediction there may be a 10 percent gap, then we are reasonably sure that whoever we are thinking is the leader will actually win. 
Uh -huh. So we translate these vote estimates into what we call predicted probability of win uh -huh. uh, through a simple probabilistic mechanism uh -huh. and then generate, adding up the probabilities, we generate the expected seats. Okay. So that has been a methodology which essentially we worked out the first time around and have tweaked it, but essentially it remains the same through my uh, 14 years where I've done three nation, nationwide polls and at least uh, 15 to 20 uh, big state polls. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. This has been a conversation with Professor Rajiv Karandikar, who is currently the director of the Chennai Mathematical Institute. Thank you.